All right, guys, it is a gorgeous fall evening, the fall of 2022, and I am already somehow gotten myself locked into the back of the chair. What in the hell? Sancho, what is going on already? Ah, oh, it is a lovely moonlit, it is a Thursday night, November 3rd. 2022 where it has been 70 degrees today and will be for the next several days and I have been a little bit busy trying to saw my leg off with a chainsaw as hard as I've tried so far I have not sawed my leg off but there's always another day but I have been busy planet nibbling and uh but I can finally uh bring you a chronicle of the collapse and I am absolutely shocked if not to see the O word at least the P word showing up in the mainstream media and I've mentioned this outfit before called the conversation academic rigor with journalistic flair and we're gonna hear from a fellow today who looks a bit like a cleaned up Ted Kaczynski. This fellow never heard of Manfred Laubacher. Manfred Laubacher is a global futures professor and president's professor of theoretical biology and history of biology at Arizona State University. So there you go. So this man sounds like he should know what he's talking about, and I do not believe it. The title of Manfred's essay in the conversation. We're gonna learn about the Anthropocene <laughs> engine. Are you snorkeling? Yes? The Anthropocene engine titled Eight Billion Humans, How Population Growth and Climate Change Are Connected as the Anthropocene Engine Transforms the Planet. Do you think so? At first glance, the connection between the world's growing population and climate change seems obvious. Seems obvious to about... Uh, Let's see, how many people think it's the connection between the world's growing population and climate change seem obvious? Huh. The more people we have on this planet, the larger their collective impact on the climate. And again, uh, guys, it's not just the climate. The climate is one of nine planetary boundaries where the larger the population, the larger the collective impact. I'm going to say this one more time. If climate change had nothing to do with it, okay, if humans made zero difference to the climate, there are eight other ways that 8 billion people can destroy a planet. I would start with habitat destruction when talking about the Anthropocene engine. But anyway, they're going to put this in terms of climate because you can't get an article about overpopulation or anything else uh, published in the mainstream media if you don't make it all about climate when climate has almost nothing to do with the situation at this point. I am sounding a little bit like Book Hermit because Book Hermit has good reason for sounding like he does. Anyway, <clears throat> with that little uh, segue out of the way, let's get back to Manfred here. Okay. A closer look with a longer time horizon reveals relationships between population size and climate change that can help us better understand both 
humanity's predicament as the global population nears 8 billion people, a milestone the United Nations expects the world to hit on November 15th. 12 days from now, number 8 billion, like they have any idea. My guess is we hit 8 billion people two or three years ago. Nobody knows how many people are on the planet. Nobody knows how many people are in this country. The first thing you learn in U.S. Census School, where I have been, is nobody knows how many people are on the planet. Can we cut this 8 billion crap? It's pulling a number out of the air. Okay? It means virtually nothing. It means there's too damn many people on the planet. I can see Manfred's essay is going to be getting interrupted. All right, but let's look back to the Stone Age. We were talking, what's this dude, a professor of the something of to do with history? All right, let's go back to the Stone Age when there were what, like, one one thousandth of the number of people on the planet. <clears throat> For much of human evolu evolution, our ancestors were exposed to large climatic fluctuations between ice ages and intermittent warming periods. The last of these ice ages ended about 10,000 years ago, and that's, you know, when we came into the Goldilocks age, the otherwise known as the Holocene, where the population in the Goldilocks age has gone from, who knows, 500 million to 8 billion or so. But the Holocene is coming to an end. Before the ice sheets melted, sea levels were about 400 feet lower than they are today. Can you say the Bering Land Bridge? That allowed humans to migrate around the world. And everywhere, everywhere humans went, our ancestors reshaped their landscapes. Ten thousand years ago, humans were reshaping entire landscapes with no help from fossil fuels or global industrial civilization. Humans do not need fossil fuels or any of this other crap to destroy a planet. Reshaping landscapes is fancy word for destroying a planet, for making a mess of things everywhere we step. Okay. First, we did this by clearing forest, which is what I've been doing for the past three days, you know, acting like, you know, some caveman with a chainsaw. <clears throat> First, by clearing forest, and then through early agricultural practices that emerged in a number of regions starting, wow, no, sh you know, uh, imagine this, that emerged in a number of regions starting just as the last ice age ended. Huh, this is real college level stuff here. Paleoclimatologist William Ruddeman has suggested that these early actions, you know, by, by the early humans cutting down trees and expanding farming, for example, caused a small initial rise in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That contributed to a stable climate over the past 10,000 years by counteracting trends of declining carbon dioxide levels that might have triggered another glaciation event. So good old humans, 
thank God for humans, we held off another ice age. We made just enough carbon emissions to hold off uh, what should have been another ice age by now. Okay. By reshaping their landscapes, you know, by destroying the planet and ruining life for every other species of earthling that they came into contact with. This is another fuller definition of reshaping landscapes. I have been reshaping a landscape for the past three or four days. Humans, we, we just have it in our DNA. It is the landscape reshaping gene. I absolutely love it. I was just telling my buddy, this is my favorite thing in the world to do. My number one favorite, well, since I don't have sex anymore, is to reshape landscapes. I live to reshape landscapes. I'm all about this. <clears throat> By reshaping our landscapes, our ancestors actively constructed the niches they inhabited. This process is an important aspect of evolutionary change, creating important feedback dynamics between evolving species and their environment. As humans evolved, the demands of our growing population, associated knowledge creation, and energy use created a feedback cycle my colleagues and I call the Anthropocene engine, and that engine has transformed the planet. So one by one in our little bands of hunter-gatherers, we reshaped our landscapes like I'm doing 500 feet from where I'm sitting. Taken together, we have created the Anthropocene engine, which has transformed the planet. We have reshaped the planet. And we are now revving up the Anthropocene engine. <clears throat> the Anthropocene engine has been running now for at least 8,000 years. It led to the rise of modern civilizations and ultimately to the environmental challenges we face today, including climate change. So how does the Anthropocene engine work? First, populations had to reach a critical number of people to successfully create enough knowledge about their environment that they could begin to actively and purposefully transform the niches they lived in. Successful agriculture was the product of such knowledge. In turn, agriculture increased the amount of energy available to these early societies. Hmm. More energy supports more, fill in the blank, more energy supports more, Alistair? Humans. What? Humans. Not very good. They actually say people. I would agree with Alistair. Humans. This guy said people, he, Manfred, does not understand the difference between humans and people. Alistair does. Okay, I'm going to go with Alistair. More energy supports more humans. More humans led to early settlements of humans, and probably little dogs, and later to cities. This allowed for task specialization and division of labor, which in turn accelerated the creation of more knowledge, which increased more available energy. And 
Wow! Allowed population size to grow. Hmm. And so on and on and on and on. And here we are. While the details of this process differ around the world, they are all driven by the same Anthropocene engine, which leads us to the next chapter, the problem of exponential growth. As an evolutionary biologist and historian of science, I have studied the evolution of knowledge and complexity for over three decades and have been developing mathematical models with colleagues to help explain these processes. Using the quote, universality of the underlying processes driving the Anthropocene engine, we can capture these dynamics in the form of a growth equation, which includes links between population growth and increasing energy use. I would flip that sentence around, you know, increasing use in population growth. And so then, of course, for anybody who has not seen this, I don't know how well you can see it. Uh, this is the growth in human population over the last 10,000 years. I know you've seen this uh, hockey stick, you, you know, 9,900 years, the line barely moved. Well, 9,800 years, and then we went from 1 billion to 8 billion, and how long now? Surprisingly, he doesn't have this graph right up next to, uh, you know, fossil fuels. The, you know, the, the introduction of fossil fuels into the planet graphing that, and the other big one, nitrogen fertilizer. You take the human population graph, you put it next to the fossil fuel graph, you put it next to the nitrogen fertilizer graph, which of course, nitrogen fertilizer is based, is 100% dependent on fossil fuels. So those two are kind of the same. You, you end fossil fuels, you just stop oil, which means just stop gas, you stop fossil fuels, you stop the nitrogen fertilizer, and you stop, you, you know, and you will see this graph, you know, plummet. Now, within six months, one half of the population of the planet would be dead if we stop fossil fuels. Okay. One consequence of positive feedback cycles in dynamical systems is that they have led to exponential growth, as in the hockey stick, is exponential growth. Exponential growth can start very slowly and be barely noticeable for quite some time but eventually, it will have dramatic consequences wherever resources become limited. Wow! I know this is real Doomer uh, 101, but you know, every once in a while, someone new comes down this rabbit hole and starts to figure out, sorry, <clears throat> Okay, driven by the Anthropocene engine, human population has grown exponentially, and individual societies have approached collapse multiple times over the past 8,000 years, and nothing approached collapse about it. They've completely collapsed and fallen on their ass. I don't know why he would say this about how, you know, little individual local societies have approached collapse. They have collapsed, 
multiple times over the 8,000 over 8,000 years, the disappearance of the Easter Island civilization and the collapse of the Mayan Empire, for example, have been linked to the depletion of environmental resources as populations rose. The dramatic decline of the European population during the Black Death in the 1300s was a direct consequence of crowded and unsanitary living conditions that facilitated the spread of plague. Biologist Paul Ehrlich warned about unchecked growth in his 1968 book, The Population Bomb, predicting growing global demand for limited resources would lead to societal collapse without changes in human consumption. And here we go. The most intelligent article I have read uh, in the mainstream media, certainly in 2022, and here it comes, you knew the hopium was going to come. Otherwise, if the hopium did not come, this article would not have been printed. Uh, it sure as hell would not have been picked up by Yahoo News. And the guy probably wouldn't have a job. This is why he has to come up with this bullshit hopium. Here we go. The big but. The big but. But, globally, humanity, well, up until now, has always found a way to avoid doom. I should be wearing my doom happens hat. Yes, humanity has always found a way to avoid doom. Knowledge-based innovation, innovations, such as the Green Revolution, the broad-scale effects of which Ehrlich did not foresee, have enabled people to reset the clock, leading to more cycles of innovation and almost, almost collapse. Yes. <clears throat> One example is the sequence of energy regimes. It started with wood and animal power, then came coal, oil, and gas. Fossil fuels powered the Industrial Revolution, and with it, greater wealth and advances in healthcare. But the age of fossil fuels has had dramatic consequences. It almost doubled the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in less than 300 years, causing the unprecedented speed of global warming that humanity is experiencing today on this 70 degree day in November day in New York. At the same time, inequality has become endemic poorer nations that contributed little to climate change are suffering the most from global warming, while just 20 wealthier countries are responsible for about 80% of emissions. The next energy, the next energy transition to avoid collapse is underway right now with the rise of renewable energy sources like wind and solar power. But studies show humans are not evolving their energy use fast enough to keep climate change in check. And wrapping up, using knowledge to reset the cycle again. Okay, this is the I guess this is that great reset that these conspirators are always talking about. The great reset. <clears throat> Every 
every species, if left unchecked, would grow exponentially. I'm sure colony of cells will agree with that. But species, well, most species, unlike one species, are subject to constraints, otherwise known as negative feedback mechanisms, such as predators and limited food supplies. The Anthropocene engine has allowed humans to emancipate ourselves from many of these negative feedback mechanisms that otherwise would have kept our population's growth in check. We intensified food production. We developed trade among regions and discovered medications to survive diseases. So, where does this leave humanity now? Are we approaching inevitable collapse? <clears throat> From climate change of our own making, or can we transition again and discover innovations that reset the cycle. Introducing negative feedback into our socio-economic technical systems, not as radical population control or war, but in the form of norms, values, and regulations on excess greenhouse gas emissions can help keep climate change in check. Humanity can use knowledge to keep itself within its environmental boundaries. Humanity can use knowledge to keep itself within its environmental boundaries. No, you clueless moron, humanity can use knowledge to keep itself without environmental boundaries up to a certain point. And then we're going to find out about within environmental boundaries. So instead of reading any comments from this story, uh, do I have it called up? I just want to touch on this one where uh, an associated story from good old AP, climate questions, does what I do matter? You know, asking the big question, do individual lifestyle and consumer actions do anything to save the planet? This fellow named Humpty Dumpty this is what Humpty Dumpty had to say. Not breeding is the only thing any human can do to stop the buck here once and for all. But don't worry, Constitution Craig, Constitution Craig took issue with Humpty Dumpty Wrong. The population, <laughs> this is not, this guy is not being ironic. This guy honestly believes this statement. This is one of the big memes of the Alex Jones, Donald Trump crowd. Wrong. The population of the earth can fit into the state of Texas with 1,200 square feet each. There you go. 1,200, a 30 by 40 foot piece of the planet to keep them fed, watered, housed, energized, uh, 1,200 square feet. And then not yet silenced, uh, weighing in the left the left, you know, uh, I don't know what left they're talking about. The left wants human life off this planet. 
That is their unstated goal. That is why Stacy Abrams, whoever, I have no idea who Stacy Abrams is, urges more abortions. And then Spark weighs in, except for their own, meaning they only want, the lefties only want Trump tards to have abortions. And then as far as not breeding, you could go one step further. The big, uh, the big uh, comedians. You know, I don't hear that one much anymore. I used to get that, that all the time uh, about if you're so in favor of uh, saving the planet by eliminating humans, uh, save the planet, kill yourself. Uh, I, now, I did have that bumper sticker for a while, uh, meaning if, if, if everybody on the planet killed themselves, we would save the planet. But uh, you know what they're saying. Uh, if you believe, okay, if you're one of the one, one thousandth of one percent of humans on the planet who believe that human extinction is the only thing to save the planet, that, so if one one thousandth of one percent of the people, and I guess they would all be lefties, I, I know every lefty that I have ever met I have never met a lefty with children, uh, but if they would kill themselves and the planet's population was reduced by one one thousandth of one percent, then those left behind could all move to the state of Texas and have 1,200 square feet to live off of. And I, now, don't get me wrong, guys, I do highly support uh, everybody, you know, except for me, moving to the great state of Texas. I would love to see all 8 billion people move to the great state of Texas. And uh, that is why I moved away from the state of Texas, one of many reasons. Yes, Kat? You agree with human extinction saving the planet? But uh, I have to go meet a man about a pile of rocks. So uh, we will catch you tomorrow with the Manga Bay Roundup. Yes, little dog. My guys. Yes, yellow cat.